Welcome to the implementation explanation video of this two-part rig explanation. For those of you that came here first but still want to know about the parts being discussed, click the link on the upper right to do so. For the rest, let me help you get your bearings and tell you what this rig is about. The design should allow you to do three things in particular to bolster your virtual reality experience very greatly. The first of these things is providing an optimal setup to allow you to quickly equip your VR system without having to deal with too many accessories. If you want to know how to go about this, click on the top rightmost link. The second is a potential reduction in the effects of motion sickness as a byproduct of intense proprioceptive with kinesthetic immersion and sensory substitution. If you're interested in our thoughts on this area, click on the middle rightmost link. The third and greatest advantage of this rig is the ability for the user to enjoy the full breadth of motion allowed by motion controls without the need for full-on motions, or at the very least, the ability to use one's appendages with at least the amount of capability as one would with a Kinect 1 or 2, thus allowing the replication of the human gait. In truth, this is where the meat of the video will lie, so if you wish to skip ahead to that part, click on the bottom rightmost link. I won't mind. Now then, on to the explanation. Currently, Virtual reality setups at the moment can be very large and have lots of parts dangling off one's head. With the Oculus Rift, gaming headset, and an Emo TV pop, one's head is very much covered in technology. It can be very tedious to have to place all of these elements together at once. Not to mention that once the Rift is on, getting one's bearing on a mouse and keyboard or a controller can be very tricky without proper preparations, making the transition experience from reality to virtual reality uncomfortable and difficult in some cases. By using a helmet and easy to equip bands, the process no longer becomes tedious and can be rather exciting if prepared well. Using a helmet, one can resolve cable management as well as hide a greater amount of electronics being used in a more stylish package. Having all the items already in a static package makes putting things on as simple as closing the face shield on a helmet, Iron Man style. The bands themselves should be no harder to put on than other fitness bands and the lack of optical positioning or bright light condition requirements should reduce the issues that are experienced with typical motion controls in VR. Being attached to the body should also kill off the can't find my controller issue that is faced when one is using an HMD with no IRL camera viewfinder connection. VR no longer has to look completely insane, so much as just a little weird or badass if you're doing it while wearing a leather jacket and some pretty cool jeans. Motion sickness or simulation sickness has popped up as an issue in virtual reality for quite a while now. The earlier versions of the Oculus Rift and its current dev kit bore the issues of motion blur and imperfect tracking causing motion sickness, though I will say that the Oculus Rift at its crystal cove state seems to have reduced these issues so perhaps the rig's anti-motion sickness feature will prove redundant. But alas, what well, can't hurt now, can it? So let's go on with this explanation. The system uses two things to mitigate the effects of motion sickness. Sensory reduction combined with sensory substitution and proprioceptive combined with kinesthetic dominance to reduce the effects. You see, the anti-gravity or zero-gravity position recommended comes partially out of a need to make the body not trust the data it obtains from the vestibular system, as having a similar room temperature, background noise, and consistent picture make the body zone the senses out, so too do we believe will happen if the effects of gravity are reduced as well even if only the sensation of placebos are in mind. Then comes the array of vibration motors we have recommended installing in the helmet. These motors will activate in conjunction to inputs from the game. Over time, these minute inputs are expected to play the role of vestibular substitution systems similarly to those of systems people with devices like the brain port use. Still, this is only part of the balance equation. Immersion of the body as a whole could be the key to calming a few of the residual motion sickness effects people are experiencing. With the current virtual reality systems we're using, we're immersing only two senses particularly well, and the rest are either ignored or partially immersed. The wrist movement following of the head's rotation and more recently position are in essence partial immersion of the head's region of kinesthesia and proprioception. Your body as a whole, however, doesn't get this benefit. You're still likely moving your body around with the controller or experiencing things in a very passive manner to avoid incurring motion sickness. This could be confusing that partially immersed senses as they're under the impression that they're in another world, but at the same time they're still stuck in ours. 
while this can be adapted to over time, I think that the act of immersing the rest of the body in this regard should be sufficient to ease that dissonance. After perusing a few forums where people discuss virtual reality, I have noticed that a few people have noticed that their sensations of motion sickness improved a bit when they were using well-adjusted motion controllers like the Rager Heiser or STEM. This gives the impression that perhaps the body is using the sense of conformity that the body provides to make up for the lack of proper footing in a virtual reality space. Still, while just a concept, this could be worth more research and I think that pursuing increased immersion of other senses could be the keys to a more comfortable virtual reality experience in the near term. Still, how does one go about giving somebody full body controls at a gaming ready speed without motion controls combined with an omnidirectional treadmill? That's where the EMGs come in. The electromyogram is the key component of this rig design, leaving the rest of supports to this item. An EMG is a device used to detect the subtle electrical impulses being released when your muscles activate. Based upon the levels and types of impulses, one can actually get an idea of what the subject's body is doing. This allows developers to interpret the user's input and tie software responses accordingly. Now, I'm sure you must be wondering what makes this any better than, say, motion controls or a button. For that, I say two things. Speed and precision. With motion controls, you have to depend on gyroscopes, accelerometers, and magnetometers to fathom a guess as to what your intent actually is, and in many ways, they're still only limited to detecting vectors and rotation. They lack the ability to properly gauge your precision. For that, optical sensors like the Leap Motion 3D or Connect are required. While good in their own right, they still suffer in that they require direct line of sight to the user, and should that be broken, the connection ends. If lighting conditions are poor, they may even fail to detect the user or even interpret the user incorrectly. To make matters worse, they struggle at precision in sub-millimeter ranges, and in many cases due to limits of their camera resolution and varying distances the user might have from the camera, they may not even be able to properly gauge larger movements. Lastly, users are usually limited to mirroring the actions they desire to do in-game in the real world, an act which can be very physically demanding, leading to the intrusion of a very significant real-world limitation to virtual realities whose benefits are supposed to be freedom from worldly limits in both interactive and sensual angles. So where do EMGs fall in all this? EMGs skip over most of these problems entirely, and then some. Optical tracking is pretty much unnecessary if the user inputs their physiological data correctly and places the item on a part of their body consistently. Muscle data can be accurate to at least three significant figures, and in some cases can be detected before the signal even reaches the intended body part and performs the action. In game development, milliseconds can be the difference between lag and buttery goodness, so giving some leeway time in an input is downright godly. I've even read some reports of EMG systems that allow for detection of signals in legs for up to half a second in advance, though where this stands with surface EMGs remains to be seen. Sub-33 millisecond inputs are expected though. If row, pitch, yaw, and vectors are required, magnetometers, accelerometers, and gyroscopes are still available options though their usage could preferably be used as tightening up values rather than completely rotating data from them. Lastly, it's about time I stated how in the world this design could allow users to use the full range of motion in games without the need to use the actual full range of motion. By using an EMG with at least three significant figures of data, one can obtain sub-millimeter levels of data detection, or in the case of new moving body part, a space of energy application prior to successful movement. Our body parts have weight to them, the supplying sufficient amount of energy to them to move is a requirement in optical motion controls. But for muscle activity, this is a no mandate. You can increase the sensitivity of a character's in-game model bones to interpret a very small application of force as an incredibly large one. By weighing down the hands a bit, the user can even increase the amount of force required and thus increase the ranges of energies available for usage within a virtual reality simulation. With proper calibration and a bit of time to adapt, a user could theoretically obtain enough data to allow for a full breadth of motion controls at the application of less strength than is needed to lift one's arms. Applying this to legs allows for the performance of a full gait cycle without actually walking, negating the issue that locomotion poses to full movement motion controllers such as the Kinect and Prio VR. With this, the entire body becomes an input device, rendering the need for a traditional controller a moot point for proper design of virtual reality software. Don't think that the appendages are the only areas that can benefit either. I visited an EOG, which runs on fundamentally similar technology on this rig, for the helmet as well due to the fact that current visual immersion technologies like the Rift make optical eye tracking a difficult feat to achieve. 
so using an EOG on the eyes can bypass the issue altogether. Also, rather than using both eyes, using only one is more than sufficient as the vast majority of people have at least one eye that shows where the gaze is and that should be more than sufficient for this end. While we're at it, may as well track the neck with EMGs to steadily remove the need to spend on gyroscopes, accelerometers and magnetometers for motion controls as well. Maybe you don't think that current EMGs or EOGs are capable of these functions, but I beg to differ. Right now, many prosthetic legs use EMGs to aid on the computers in calculating the proper trajectories from missing legs or feet. Prosthetic arms or hands use EMGs to gather data on the user's desired inputs and translate them to usable everyday applications with differing levels of strength and applications to boot. And that's not enough? This rig is even in taking into account the eventual succeeding technology of direct mental input gathering with the usage of an electroencephalogram, or EEG for short. By having the EEG pick up and attempt to predict the motion ahead of time based upon brainwaves, one can simply use the data from the preceding EMGs to confirm whether or not this prediction is correct, steadily aiding in the creating of profiles on brain behavior that can be invaluable towards research and development in these fields. Think of EMGs like the Mayo in this rig as a form of training wheels that will eventually be removed as time goes on. Still, have doubts? I'll provide you with a bunch of links on various different research products that display this technology at work. You'll be amazed at how precise the inputs can get. I challenge you not to get excited. There you have it. That is the rig I have in mind for the year of 2014. Perhaps it's a bit too optimistic, but for the near term, I think it's the most viable option we have for virtual reality controls on the road to sort out online or the matrix levels inputs that we can get in our time. I had really thought that we wouldn't have the ability to enjoy virtual reality until the projected 2022 of Sword Art Online, but now that I can see the intermediary in the field before me, I'm not going to let the opportunity to pass me by. Will you? Phew. <sighs> have I wanted to get this video out here for a while now. I hope you all enjoyed the video, and please know that this channel will be a host to a lot more content in the area of virtual reality in the future. I haven't even explained what the calibration variables will be used for, or even given out any ideas or concepts on the implementation of virtual reality into things like game design. If you like what you got now, or what I'll probably be doing in the future, click the subscribe button and follow the Ghost Art James Twitter and Facebook page for more. Want to discuss the rig design? Leave a few comments down below, and head over to the Oculus Rift out on the matter that I'll be leaving open for you to enjoy. Well, till the next time.